why I was interested in this area is that in medical school, and maybe some of you were attracted to other disciplines, but I really liked OB. Um, I love the idea of women's health, of family planning. And of course, I'm going to say women's health, but now that we're sort of, um, you know, speaking in more gender neutral terms, it's really people who have, who are born female and have female hormones, even if they don't identify as female. Um, but I will say women, it's a little bit of a relic, but that's what a lot of these programs are still called. I hope that that language will continue to shift. But anyway, I loved OB, but I had a really brutal um, rotation and I was at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine for uh, my uh, medical school and it was at Jacoby. And I just felt like all of the um, all of my supervisors and all the physicians were so grumpy and I saw people like that were in their middle you know maybe in their 50s still doing overnights um, and I was like this is pretty rough and no one seems so happy um, and so I was like I really like this but maybe this isn't for me and I absolutely as many of you maybe have fell in love with psychiatry fell in love with really getting to know my patients and then finding out that this field existed um, and it sort of brought the two together was so exciting. Um, so I kind of knew beforehand that it existed. And I particularly knew that my program where I did general psychiatry, Columbia had a women's mental health program that was one of the earliest ones in addition to MGH. Um, so the field is relatively new. And let me share uh, this PowerPoint with you all. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so can you all see that? Just a thumbs up, okay, cool. Um, so it's relatively new. I would say probably on the order of like 30 years old. Um, we started with a lot of research because um, you know many of you haven't experienced general psychiatry residencies, but you'll start to find that when people have a pregnant patient on a unit, they're kind of like, oh, oh shit, what do we do? Do we stop all the medications? Do we give her the medications? Um, it becomes sort of like, unfortunately, general psychiatrists, especially maybe a little bit older. I'm hopeful that more programs today are cognizant that this is a population that needs treatment. Um, so I hope the training now in the general psychiatry field is a little bit better, but what I found even at a program like Columbia where they have this specialty is like people don't really know what to do. They're kind of a little bit confused, um, but in general reproductive psychiatry focuses on um, a lot of different areas. So it's diagnosing mental and behavioral health issues, of course, like all general psychiatrists, um, but something that we particularly do is preconception planning for women with psychiatric disorders, but as you know, over 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. So sometimes we can't do that planning. Um, so then we really focus on pregnancy and postpartum depression and anxiety, uh, medication management during breastfeeding, pregnancy loss, infertility or difficulty conceiving. And that's actually a huge part of my practice. Um, mood changes related to infertility treatments is huge, as well as premenstrual symptoms and premenstrual dysphoric disorder, and of course, menopause related issues. Um, so the, the range is large. And so that most training programs will train you in all these different areas. But the real focus in most programs is perinatal psychiatry, which is pregnancy, preconception, pregnancy and postpartum care. And I do think that um, postpartum depression and anxiety has gotten more traction in the last couple of years. Um, if any of you remember, you know, Brooke Shields coming out and then this might be a little older, but like Tom Cruise having a little flip out. Um, but anyway, it's coming more into people's understanding. I think more people in um, the limelight are open about their struggles, especially in the postpartum period. But I think what we still need to shed a lot of light on is that pregnancy itself, um, I think used to be thought even by psychiatrists as like bliss. Oh, if someone has a psychiatric disorder, it'll go away during pregnancy. It's such a wonderful time in someone's life when in fact, 50% of depression and anxiety in the postpartum starts in pregnancy. Um, so it's really something that I do a lot of education of OBs because we really have to work together. They're often the frontline workers that see these people and often don't ask the right questions and then they come to us. Um, but it's a really exciting field that's multidisciplinary. So you'll see 
psychiatrists that have this specialty, but we also have a lot of therapists ranging from social workers to PhDs that also are doing things very much focused on perinatal uh, psychiatry or psychology. Um, so why it's important is that 50% of all patients um, that you'll see, in, especially in psychiatry, are, are female. 80% um, of those will experience at least one pregnancy in their life. As I mentioned, most of them are unplanned. And, you know, perinatal mental illness is quite common. It has a great amount of morbidity, and it's often missed. So, you know, this is something that's... Uh, pretty significant. And like I said, you know, most people don't come to us saying, Oh, my God, I have perinatal uh, anxiety or depression, I need treatment, they'll go to their OB or midwife and ask for help or, or sort of maybe display some of the symptoms. But we've seen that a lot of it goes unnoticed, undetected, um, no questions are asked, you know, even the fact that most postpartum appointments with an OB or midwife are six weeks after delivery. And we know that those six weeks are some of the most vulnerable and most patients do not see anyone, any care provider. Um, so we're trying to change that, and particularly in California, I know more of the new state laws and I work with an organization that does a lot of advocacy work. And in California, we now have a law that says that anyone that treats a pregnant patient needs to ask some of these questions related to perinatal depression. But there's been a lot of argument and back and forth because then the OBs are like, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Do I treat it? Do I refer people? And of course, as we know, mental health services are difficult to get into. Um, they're very rare, especially when in big cities, you know, you have a lot of psychiatrists that are charging out of network fees and not taking insurances or not taking what we call Medi-Cal, which is Medicaid. Um, so it's a really big struggle, and we definitely need more people that are that know what to do in, in this area. And of course, in the US alone, postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety occurs at rates of what we think is 20%. Um, we don't know that figure for sure, but it is very, very common. Um, some other things are these disorders are pretty complex and the literature is expanding. And you know, when you're a general psychiatrist, it's really hard to keep up with everything. And of course, we see addiction, we see all sorts of things in general practices, but why there's an argument that this field should be one on its own, and actually, currently, it's not a board certified, um, like addiction psychiatry, like forensics, like CL, but we're hoping that as more programs build, we can make the argument that it really should be a board certified, if you believe in board certified. Um, there's a lot of arguments against that and that it's a little bit of a racket um, to charge us a lot of money every year to belong to uh, one of these uh, boards and to take tests every 10 years. But anyway, I think it's, it deserves sort of importance on its own. If you, this is a great example, if you do PubMed search on pregnancy and depression, you get over 10,000 hits. Um, with over 700 of those being published in the last year. So the field is really growing. Um, I'm not in the research area, but that's a really blossoming area. And what's wonderful is that a lot of programs, especially at university medical centers, will combine both. So you can have a clinical and a research experience if that's what you're interested in. Um, and so this is just uh, sort of from another talk, but it's just to say that this uh, data is really hard and complicated and deserves study on its own because unlike any other data that we have where we can have a lot of randomized control trials, in pregnancy, it's very difficult, and you might have heard about this with the vaccines, with the COVID vaccines. It's very difficult in the United States currently to test women who are pregnant um, and their fetuses, right, and, and sort of do randomized control trials in that way because there's been a lot of ethical questions, right? The fetus is not a consenting participant of the study, um, but truly it, it, what happens is that pregnant people are disenfranchised in terms of the evidence that we have, and we don't have this gold standard of evidence from psychiatric medications all the way to diabetes medications, hypertension medications during pregnancy. So what we have instead are more retrospective studies, which as you all know, have more confounders. So things like tobacco, alcohol, drugs, all sort of get into this data. And so they do require, I think, more thoughtful and thorough assessment of all of this. Um, so again, uh, do I expect most general psychiatrists to know the, the general outlines of how to treat 
um, people during these life changes, especially pregnancy, yes, but it can be really difficult to be an expert in this area because it does require a lot. Um, new fellowship programs are being added every year, which is very exciting. Some states don't have them yet, but there's at least 16 that I was able to look up um, that have already been established. Uh, and many leading institutions, like I mentioned, Mass General and Columbia, have really well-established programs that have been around now for decades. And then here's just some of the goals of perinatal anxiety. And again, I, I, perinatal psychiatry, I don't want to sort of bog you down with the details, um, but some of the overarching themes that we wanna minimize risk of relapse, of course, we wanna limit maternal illness, really think about maternal choice, minimal, minimize fetal exposure. Um, but also I think it's important, a lot of people think that they're not allowed to take anything or do anything during pregnancy, um, but there are effective and safe treatments during pregnancy and breastfeeding. And we wanna treat to remission and open communication with team members. And I'll briefly just tell you, um, this is sort of some considerations. Um, again, this is a little bit level of more detail for people that are starting to treat these patients um, and how we wanna look at patients in general. Um, but risks of untreated mood and anxiety disorders during pregnancy, I've listed them all here. We don't have to go into detail about them, but I think people in, especially in perinatal psychiatry are very focused on the risks of a medication, let's say on a fetus, instead of being um, more open to what are the risks of untreated mood and anxiety. So this is for me a risk risk analysis because doing nothing actually poses a risk um, to mom and her baby, um, and actually to the family system. Uh, so these are just some of the things we've started to think about and, and see in some studies. And of course, these are just some of the modalities that we use. I'll talk a lot about medications. And of course, as psychiatrists, we're uh, the people privileged in the field to be able to prescribe, but there are a lot of other things that can really be helpful um, during the perinatal period and, and otherwise, you know, and all sorts of things. You know, I always love complementary alternative medications. Um, there's really wonderful mindfulness med meditation, individual therapy, I think is an integral part of every kind of psychiatric treatment. Whether you're doing it or you have someone else doing it for you, these are some of the therapy interventions, um, particularly IPT, interpersonal therapy, and CBT, as well as psychodynamic psychotherapy. We have some really great evidence as being very effective during pregnancy and the postpartum. And then this is sort of an outline of why people are very concerned about medication use during pregnancy. And typically, you know, in these programs, you'll learn all of the, the risks and be able to give a really uh, focused and important risk discussion with your patients, but also to tell them what the benefits are of taking these medications and how you can mitigate some of these risks. And of course, uh, you know, most patients you'll talk to, you know, you're, you're just having a conversation about an SSRI or a, ser a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. But what's really amazing about this practice is being able to treat people with a range of illnesses. And so I treat people with bipolar disorder, uh, schizophrenia I used to more, not so much anymore, but you know, how can these people have safe pregnancies and postpartum periods? And then this is just a little bit of like fetal development happens in all sorts of stages, but brain develops the entire pregnancy. So that's where our role is so important um, in, in sort of advising and helping our patients through this difficult time. And as you, if you've ever been pregnant or you know pregnant people, um, you're very concerned about what you put in your body and what happens. Um, I think that's the case if you've ever been around a pregnant person and they're like, I'm not drinking caffeine or, or my doctor says I can't have tuna or something like that. So imagine Imagine those seem like, you know, lower level decisions. Imagine when there's a mental health issue and how complicated that can be. And so this is a very rough sort of um, PowerPoint, but I would love to answer any questions you might have um, about uh, perinatal psychiatry or reproductive psychiatry or about my practice or anything else.
So I see a hand up with Morgan. You can certainly talk right away. Sure. Um, awesome. It's good to meet you. Uh, thank you so much for giving this talk. I'm super interested in, um, I didn't, I've never heard of reproductive psychiatry and I love the concept. Um, I'm wondering if you have any experience um, recommending uh, herbal treatments to women um, who are either postpartum or pregnant. Yeah, so that is a great question because I actually love complementary medicine in general. Um, and it's something that I'm passionate about, but we imagine we have little research or actually we have a good body of research that's retrospective on traditional Western medications because pharmaceuticals have decided to do those studies. But you know, with complementary medicines, what's always difficult is that the studies are of lower quality um, and just aren't as robust. Uh, but one substance that I have had good luck with um, and is for sort of mild depression is called SAMI. And we do have some nice studies, but I tell my patients they're relatively small. Mm -hmm. SSRIs are actually, when we think, even though they're retrospective studies and they're not the randomized control trials that we like, they're actually the most studied in the hundreds of thousands in together millions of patients. Um, so that's really robust. Um, and so the thing with pregnancy and what we want to be careful about is to not um, do too many exposures. We want to really keep the exposures at a minimum. So often we say what's worked for you in the past is something we want to try. Mm -hmm. So if someone has never been on an SSRI and isn't interested and has very mild depression, they've tried therapy, they're trying breast treatments, they do acupuncture, you know, they're doing a lot and it's not working. Sometimes SAMI is a nice place to start. And I feel comfortable with the, the limited um, evidence base with that. But, you know, there's some other ones that we have sort of conflicting data about. Magnesium is also something that's wonderful for sleep. It's safe. A lot of OBs prescribe it as well. So that's something for insomnia and a little anxiety that I like to, to prescribe. But for example, melatonin has a lot of conflicting evidence, both during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, so it becomes a little complicated there, but a uh, very limited amount, unfortunately, of complementary medicines available to us that I think have robust evidence. Sure, and is that a formulation? Of wh which one? Sammy, I haven't heard of it. Oh yeah, SAMI, so if you look it up, it's SAM-E, it's a naturally occurring substance um, and it's one that's available pretty widely. I mean, of course I would talk to your OB about it um, and just sort of run it by if, if you or someone, you know, you're, you're recommending it to someone, um, but that's a good one. And magnesium is also readily available over the counter. Um, and can be very helpful for sleep, not just for pregnant people, actually in general. I would have liked to take it in med school if I had the opportunity, because the, well, there's a lot of people that have magnesium deficiencies, especially during pregnancy. But it's tough. I wish we had more studies, but we had, you know, it's coming up with the funds for those studies that become difficult. Anyone else? Great question though. Hi, I have a question. Um, sure. So I know you mentioned that you're in private practice and I was just wondering like what your practice looks like and like if you um, do like just medication management but also like, like I don't know, psychotherapy as well. Okay. So that's just really yeah, absolutely. Um, so I decided after doing my residency that even though I love the hospital and I think when you're in school for so long and you're at these academic institutions, you kind of think like becoming an academic doctor or psychiatrist is the only thing you can do. Uh, but then I'm like, actually, I don't know. I don't think so. And um, here in Los Angeles, it's a little bit more, I think it's a little less academic. I still felt like I needed to keep some affiliation. So that's where I do some lecturing um, at different institutions. But yeah, my practice is all on my own, which can also get a little bit lonely is why I've joined, um, for example, that maternal mental health board um, to sort of just work with more therapists. And I actually, when I used to not be remote and be in person, I used to be in a psychotherapy suite. So to get some of that sort of back and forth or, you know, talk with colleagues, but my practice um, is mostly all uh, women. 
of course, there's some men that slip in and I'm like, have you looked at my website? But they have, maybe they haven't and it's just a referral. So I still love seeing men, um, but they're just not as interested when I think they read my, my focus. Um, and right now I, I recently had a baby. And so I actually was able to cut down my practice a little bit. And that's what's so great about having a private practice is that you can really figure out how many days a week you want to work. I'm currently working probably three days a week, full days. Um, and I actually love doing psychotherapy. I purposefully went to Columbia because their psychotherapy program is so strong. Um, and I see a lot of people for combined treatment, uh, but I also see some people because of course, as a psychiatrist, the rates are a little bit more than let's say like a social worker. So I sometimes do see people who are in treatment with someone else for medication management only. And there are some people who, you know, whether they, you know, just don't feel comfortable coming all the time. I do a lot of preconception counseling, which is sometimes just a one-time uh, appointment. And then they go back to maybe their OB because a lot of OBs do, or midwives do feel comfortable prescribing, let's say like sertraline, if that's all a person needs. And so sometimes that can just be a one-time visit with me. And then they go off into the world and I'm always there for them if something doesn't go well. Um, but I love that. I also have flexibility of seeing some people with more frequency. And, and I do have like to twice a week patients. Um, so very intensive psychotherapy versus seeing people every six months who are very stable or maybe just once um, during their journey uh, with me. But to establish my private practice, I actually did a lot of moonlighting at Cedar sinai in their emergency room. Um, and I think always having like another gig while you're starting a private practice is what most people do to feel sort of financially secure and also to get referrals, right? Like, especially if you're in your new city um, to sort of meet other psychiatrists, to meet other therapists, uh, I think is a great way. I also have to say, because there's so few of perinatal psychiatrists, like you won't have a lack of referrals. If people hear that you do this, they are so excited and they, you know, and they think, and they know that you're a good uh, practitioner. They're so excited. I've had so many people sort of um, want my treatment and my care and, uh, you know, it, but it, it's complicated also, private practice, I am out of network. Um, so what I do to sort of feel a little bit better about that and give back to my community, I'm actually um, Latino background and I speak Spanish fluently, it's my first language. And so I work with Providence Hospital and I see patients through them and we have a contract and those are Medi-Cal patients and I see probably uh, you know a couple hours a week of those patients um, at a reduced fee and to me that feels like okay I'm giving this back to the community where you know it wouldn't be accessible um, and unfortunately there's just none no no medical accepting a uh, perinatal psychiatrist in Los Angeles which is pretty crazy Thank you. Um, I was also wondering, I could also email you about this, but do you know of any programs that are more like more residency programs that are like focused on psychotherapy? I know you mentioned Columbia, but that's something I'm interested in. And it's really hard to look at websites because they all say they have like, I, I know, I, you know, what's so fascinating and, and this isn't totally like true. So this is a little bit of a stereotype. So there might be programs that are a little different, but I find um, that on the West Coast, like people that have been trained at UCLA are extremely biologically oriented. Like they're doing psychopharmacology, like really complex psychopharmacology. And it, so it sounds to me, and this is hearsay because I didn't go there, but just from other residents or people that have graduated that they sort of had to pursue their own psychotherapy supervisors find their own psychotherapy patients. And that to me feels really challenging and not, I don't think you're gonna get the experience that it sounds like you're looking for. So I think the East Coast programs, particularly like the New York programs, um, and, and granted that's mostly what I looked at, seem to be very strong in psychotherapy. Um, so look at whether they have like a psychoanalytic training program, because that's a big um, clue that a lot of your supervisors will likely be analysts or an analytic training. And also ask, like, when does psychotherapy start? How many patients do we get assigned? Like, what types of psychotherapy modalities will we learn? Um, and I, I wanted a program where you started in the, and I started in the second year. 
with our uh, psycho, uh, psychodynamic patients. And I thought that was exactly what I wanted. Um, so just sort of look at those, ask those questions definitely during um, interviews. Um, and I think you'll get the right answers, but I do think the East Coast seems to have a stronger history of it. And there does seem to be a tendency of the, of the more sort of West Coast being more biological. Again, there might be exceptions to this, so, you know. But I'm so glad that you're interested in doing both. That's, I think that, you know, whether you end up practicing it or not, I feel like it does make you a better um, therapist and better uh, psychiatrist to, because in some ways, every intervention and every, um, every meeting should be uh, helpful and, and sort of supportive. And I do think that those skills are essential. Dr. Eck, hi, I'm Samantha. First off, thank you so much for your talk. It's exciting to hear more about this field because I think that the, the area of perinatal psychiatry, it's so prevalent. And I'm excited to see that the stigma is kind of going away a little bit more. People are more open about it. And I think we can all relate to it as well. I had a cousin who had to deal with postpartum depression for the longest time. Like it was cultural. Her family didn't really want to acknowledge it. They're like, oh, she's going to get over it. Um, but I think my question for you is, can you just talk a little bit more about what a day in your life and your practice looks like? How many patients do you see? Um, yeah. And then also, what are some of the most common diagnoses that you help out with? Oh, absolutely. Um, let's maybe start there. So uh, most common diagnoses, I've, I'm interested in menopause and perimenopause, but as a young, and, and you'll, you'll see this, as a, a sort of a young doctor, I think there is a little bit of resistance from like over 50s to, to see you, especially when it comes to menopause. They're like, wait, you, you were pregnant? Like we are at different life stages. And this can be complicated sometimes even with gender issues um, or cultural issues of people feeling like, well, I don't totally identify with you as, as a therapist, like you're not my mirror as a therapist. And so how can you be helpful to me? And I think that's, uh, you know, of course, if it's sort of what they need to get comfortable with therapy, that's absolutely fine. And we want people to get into therapy. So I sort of am very open to, to the resistance. Um, but I also think ultimately, if you're a good therapist, you can empathize and be in the room and, and sort of have, have space for whoever is there. So that's like a, a little portion of the population that I want to see more of, but I only have like two or three patients in that age range. Um, so I see mostly perinatal issues. So during pregnancy and the postpartum, and then I have a nice segment of like 20 something year olds where it's sort of life transition or sort of a little bit of, I hate this word of this phrase of failure to launch, but just like difficulty. And I think um, the twenties have sort of been that way, especially for people who aren't in like the career tracks that we were in, for example, that sort of give you a line to like what your future is gonna be like. Um, I think it becomes sort of almost like an adolescence in your early twenties of what's going to next. And a lot of that also comes up with PMDD. So I actually see a great amount of premenstrual dysphoric disorder or just a lot of difficulties, especially during uh, the two weeks leading up to, to someone's period. Um, so that's sort of the majority of my patients. Um, my practice used to look a little different when I was in the office, um, which I loved and I can't wait to go back for when it's, when it's a little bit safer. And I think we're getting there. Um, and that used to be sort of a nine o'clock start, sometimes eight, because I tend to like to go early and leave a little bit uh, earlier until about four or five. Um, when I started my practice, I was working like whatever hours people wanted. I was like, you need seven o'clock, I'll be there. Um, or I was working all like half days Saturdays. So I do have to say when you're building a private practice and, and listen, your lifestyles could be different. You could have children. I didn't have any children and I felt like I could be flexible. And that was the way that I grew my practice. Um, but now that my practice has grown, I get a lot of referrals that I actually can't take at this point. I'm able to sort of carve out more of like, you know, what I do and what I don't do. And now with a child, I don't work on Wednesdays, for example, I limit my Saturdays to one or two patients. Um, and now that it's sort of over Zoom, 
it's a little weird because before I would do notes between patients. Now I'm like with my baby and coming back to my office, which is really difficult. And you all might have noticed this too when you're at home doing your medical swab. Yes, a lot of you are doing rotations that you still have to be in person, but working from home can be really challenging and just being able to sort of shift from one task to the other. So that's why I also prefer the office. Um, but my, my hours were sort of, you know, let's say nine to five or nine to four every day. But what's great is like if I had a doctor's appointment or if I had something, I just discuss it with my patient. I don't have to ask for a day off. I don't have to sort of do all of that finagling, which was a part of residency that I didn't love. It was like, I still felt like a child of like, may I please have this day off to go to the doctor? Can I, you know? Um, so I really like the freedom and the flexibility, especially with LA traffic. It's great to be able to say, I'm gonna leave a little bit early or I'm gonna do um, what I need. So what's great is like, you can make the hours that you want. I do think the only caveat to that is that if you are starting and you wanna grow your practice, you often do have to work you know, a little bit later because does it really make sense for us to have nine to five um, you know, hours when our patients also work from nine to five? Um, so really, if you want to grow the practice and also the diversity of patients that you're seeing, I often see a lot of people who either are stay at home parents or are flexible in their work hours, because if you if you're going to see more traditional working people, evening hours at least once a week is a great idea. And Saturdays are so popular. If you want to fill a practice, work on Saturdays because people really need it. You know, often they don't want to go to therapy after a long day of work or before work. Um, and I can certainly empathize with that. But uh, once you're, you're sort of set, you can, you can make your hours and have a lot of flexibility in it, which I think is wonderful. And there was another question, but I forgot. It was like schedule, diagnoses. Samantha, anything else that you remember? No, I think you pretty much you yeah. asked me okay. elaborated a lot. I asked about okay. like your, a day in the life, most common diagnoses, mm -hmm. uh, like maybe you covered age and patient population. Yeah, I think another part that I didn't leave, I mean, because I don't remember, it, it was so long ago since uh, COVID hit, where it's like a, a lot of it initially was networking. So I would always take like a coffee or a lunch with a local therapist or someone in the area that I wanted to really like start to get to know and share patients with. Um, so initially that was a huge part of what I was doing. And I kind of like doing it um, and meeting more people that also, you know, just helps broaden your network and, and also understand like what other people are seeing. And if you ever need a colleague to cover, that's a nice way to get acquainted of course, if you end up working where you did residency, like your co-residents will automatically bring some of that or people that you worked with at the hospital who also, you know, a lot of people are able to do like an attending job and also have a private practice. Um, and that's a really nice hybrid um, as well. And when you're in an institution and you stay at the institution, it's really not easy to get referrals. Some people even bring some of their own residency patients um, into their private practices. Uh, which is really exciting because you have a chance to see some of those people for a really long time. Um, but it is challenging to move from where you did residency and fellowship to a new city, uh, but it can be done. And I feel really comfortable and established here. Hopefully soon we'll go back to those days of networking in person. Hi, Dr. Oreck. I'm Danby. Huh? Congratulations on your baby, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I really don't know how to ask this question, but um, for me with private practice and psychiatry in general, I feel like um, patients, well, my perception is they kind of tend to doctor shop, like they, you kind of have to cater to hmm. uh, what your patient wants more. And I feel like oh. in particular, a woman who's pregnant that may not be a good com uh, combination either because she's probably more protective of um, the medications that she'll be taking. So is that something that's hard for you to navigate um, in particular? That's a, actually a great question. Um, and I think I had some of those fears as well. Um, and I think it's a little bit of, 
So it's a challenge. I, I do find like you can, you can, I do, I always do consultation calls. So a free, like 15 to 20 minute call with each person that comes into my practice, because I do think screening is important to figure out what your bandwidth is and what you can handle. For example, I love treating people with borderline pathology, but it's a lot. Um, and I had a patient, for example, that was coming three times a week and was constantly suicidal or self-injurious. And I was just like, I don't think I can add very many more to this, um, especially when I have like all these other things or like my personal life is changing. And so I think screening calls are very important. I notice the doctor shopping and these are again, gross um, generalizations. I also do a lot of addiction work and actually have had to step back from it because I find that a lot of the demands and the doctor shopping comes um, with sort of that diagnosis, unfortunately, when there's like a seeking of substances uh, and challenge around that. And I don't find it as much with my perinatal patients. Like you said, there's actually more of a resistance. So I'm actually like, no, 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 wait, this is, this isn't so bad. Like, let's talk about what could be helpful. Um, but I do think that if you do good screening and have some limitations, right? I think you know, it's all about being able to set good boundaries. And if you're able to set those boundaries, listen, some people are like, oh, this doctor's just not giving me like the benzos I want. Bye. Like, I don't want to see her. I'll just go to the next one who's going to give me the Adderall or the stimulant. If you can establish those boundaries for yourself. And I was always like, I do not give stimulants if it's not appropriate, if we don't have a good history. But I have to tell you, there's a lot of practices, especially cash practices that are like, oh, you want Vyvanse? Here you go. Like here it is, right? 15 minute um, consultation. So it's really a decision that you have to make of like, this is not what I want. And I do think that patients respond well to that because if it's not in their best interest and if they don't like it, honestly, they, you know, they can move on to a different doctor. Um, and I think that's sort of what you have to stop it. And I hope none of you feel the pressure from patients, especially when it's not uh, appropriate to give them medications you know, to build your practice. Like I, that's not fulfilling, that becomes stressful, that becomes really anxiety provoking. Um, so I set limitations, uh, you know, when I, what's great here is we have cures, other states have eye stop and you see what people get. And if I start, and I, every time I do a, a controlled uh, substance, I will see what other people are prescribing. And I had to fire a patient probably like, one year into my practice, who I saw was getting uh, benzos from other patients, from other doctors and doctor shopping. And I just said, I can't do this. If this happens again, right, we, we just, we can't work together. Um, and I had her sign something and she was a substance using patient. And eventually, like I had to say, you know, we can't work together because the, I, I don't think I can help you or I don't feel like I'm able to safely but that's a great question. And I do think, I think some people are worried about entitlement, uh, especially if you have a cash practice and you do get some pretty affluent patients who I think are used to getting their way. Um, but I think it's okay. I think those patients maybe more than anyone need boundaries and need to be told that, no, actually that's not appropriate. Um, and I do think that can be really helpful and therapeutic. And you'll find that most people aren't turned off by it and don't leave. Um, because essentially, you know, they want your expertise. That's very interesting. Thank you. It's a, it's a totally valid worry though. One that I very much had. Hi, my name is Brittany. I'm a third year medical student. Um, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I had a question um, regarding your private practice. Um, what made you choose um, to pursue your own practice rather than to join an established practice? Oh yeah, that's a great question. And I actually think an established practice could be fine, um, especially because there's great coverage. Uh, so it's a lot on me, especially in the first year. Like if I went anywhere, my phone is still on, I'm still prescribing. I bring like this thing everywhere, which is like my controlled substance prescription. Cause I'm like, if I don't have it, I don't know what to do. I think it's like, I just want to be my own boss. I think I've all, I, my parents are both freelancers. They've never had a boss. So potentially that's a little bit of what it was. And I also felt like maybe it's a little bit of a controlling thing where I felt like I could give better care if I was just in, like knew everything that was happening. And in fact, I'm more interested in building a practice 
with other people. Maybe that's like also the entrepreneurial spirit, having an NP if it grows a little bit more and, and those that was all derailed with COVID. Um, but I always imagined myself building that and not necessarily working for someone. And it still felt like that rigidity of like, ugh, you know, I have to tell them when I want to go on vacation and they have to approve it or deny it. Um, and I also think to be quite frank, uh, you can make a lot more if you're on your own, uh, but you have to also have to cover the cost. So I think it's a bigger responsibility, but I think you'll end up earning more if you do that. But, you know, some people don't want to do billing. Some people don't want to do admin work and you have to be able to take that on. I do have someone who helps me with the admin work and, and sort of doing some of the triaging of, of emails and billing. And that's been helpful, but uh, generally, I think you have to be either willing to take all those things on. And what's hard is that we don't get any training, any business training in medical school or in residency. Uh, so it's a little bit of what you have to do on your own, or if you have people that you trust that you think can help you build something, um, it's definitely worthwhile. But if you feel like, no, you know, I want to be able to like turn off when I'm on vacation, or I sort of like don't want it to be my problem, like in those practices, there's coverage over the weekend, there's coverage during the evenings, um, then I think that's also a really great fit. I just think it's a personality uh, decision. Thank you so much. And often those practices that are sort of private but and not associated with an institution can be great places to start. I think it gets a little complicated once you wanna leave, for example. Like, I don't know if you can take the patients with you and that's a little bit weird. Um, the other thing I should say is when you're attached to an academic institution, which seems like the best, right? Like you do, a, you do supervision there and you do maybe like an inpatient day or two, and then you have your own private practice. A lot of institutions want to take an incredibly big chunk of your private practice. Um, they sort of say, because you're using our name. Um, and that seems unfair, especially because we don't have that much overhead. Like we don't have a nurse, we don't have like, you know, the things dermatologists need or, or like the cardiologist needs. And yet institutions still want, I mean, I think uh, to like, to be frank, Columbia, I think wanted 50% of, of what you were getting in your private practice. Um, and I was just like, what? That's insane. And they sort of think, well, you're using our name in some ways. Um, to get your patients. So we deserve that. But I think in psychiatry, it's complicated because we just don't have those types of overheads that other doctors do where like you do need an institution sometimes to support the practice. Um, so that can be complicated and something you maybe don't have to worry about just yet. But it seems like Mark has a question or raising his. Oh, yes, yes. Hi, um, yeah. Hi, hi, good afternoon. Um, my question is, specifically, um, I guess, a uh, follow-up to your, um, uh, your talk of meeting with therapists to kind of build mm -hmm. your practice and your referrals. Um, what's your experience been like meeting with um, OB-GYN practitioners um, to get your referrals? And, you know, what are some of the benefits and challenges that you've experienced doing that? So what's so funny that you say that is because I also network a lot with them, but I didn't even mention it because I'm like, they never meet in person. Um, unfortunately, OB practices, and you might know this, OB and midwives are sort of slammed um, and they're not the kind of discipline that can just go to lunch. Um, most of the time, if you're not sort of at, at Cedars or with them at the hospital. So the OBs that I've met, which I think is a great referral and actually the most important referral source, I've done, you know, old school mailers actually have been really helpful. That was my mom's idea. I was like, you have to be a boomer to think of like mailers being helpful at all, but they love it. And I don't know if it's older people, uh, older doctors, but they get it in the mail. And they're like, oh, this flyer. And they give out my, my um, business cards. And then I think what's also been very helpful is I've connected with Cedars Providence, so some of the biggest hospital systems in my area, and I do I, I do work to do um, lectures for OB residents as well as like established OBs about perinatal mental health. And through those talks, they're like, "Oh, this person kind of knows what she's talking about," or "I like her. Um, I'll definitely refer out to her." So a little bit harder, I think, to get connected. Like 
you know, even when you call your own doctor, they're like, oh, can I put you on hold? Like, it's really hard to do those cold calls or to try to meet them in person. But I think if you're able to volunteer your time and all of my lectures are voluntary, um, that's a great way to get your name out there. I also do the same thing with IVF clinics. Um, so that's been a really big source and sometimes it's overlooked, but you can imagine people that are going through IVF, uh, both couples, you know, what, whatever type of couple they are, uh, it's a lot. Uh, it's a lot financially, it's a lot emotionally. And so that's been a really good uh, way to get referrals. And similarly, that is sort of through emails and mailers or, or volunteering to do a talk there um, in order to get my name out. And that's been really helpful. So if you like public speaking, I think that can be a nice way, you know, I hate to say this, but like to advertise yourself. Um, but OBs are definitely a great referral source. I just find that they're difficult to get a hold of, um, especially if they take insurance, like they're just slammed from the time that they start to the time that they end. And they also have like, you know, deliveries and C-sections and all of that. So a little bit hard to nail them down, but if you do, that can be great. Awesome, thank you. Hi, I have a question. <laughs> Uh, I just want to thank you again for doing this for us. Um, uh, my question was, um, you just mentioned the IVF um, couples going through a lot together. Yes. Um, and I was wondering if you also treat like the significant others, um, um, any like family members uh, of your patients as well? Yeah, so typically um, I, I don't sort of do uh, individual treatment of each. Ethically, I don't really love that. Some therapists don't mind that, but I think... Um, you know, if I'm in individual therapy with one of the members, I don't necessarily have another individual therapy with the partner, but we do a lot of group work sometimes. So I'll have the partner come in for a lot of the discussions, including of like medication safety. But if there's things that are coming up in the, in the dynamic that needs to be addressed, I think that's really important. But if they need work as a couple, I really refer them to couples therapy. And there's sometimes some really niche couples therapists that do sort of are IVF informed and know all about that process and can be helpful, but truly any therapist that is able to empathize and, and open to learning, right, can hear someone's experience and, and be helpful. But I do find, and this is interesting of like non-birthing parents also having perinatal symptoms. Um, so even if you're not pregnant and you know you don't have those hormones, sometimes the, the partner that's not giving birth can have either some depression or anxiety during the pregnancy, but in postpartum, we're seeing that a lot. And we're starting to understand more that it actually happens you know, in non-birthing partners. Specifically, there's more studies around men and, and, and fathers uh, having some of these symptoms. So they can't be overlooked either. I don't work as much with them, but there's some wonderful organizations that are doing work around paternal issues um, in pregnancy and postpartum because it's a huge change for everyone in the family. Thank you so much. But that's a great question. <laughs> and also in a good training program, like I did, I was able to do some couples work and that was really exciting. So I think when you're asking about that in your residency interviews, it can be like, what can I get exposed to? Can I do group therapy? Can I do couples treatment? Um, especially if you're interested in potentially doing those things in the future. I love that you guys are already thinking about this so early in your careers, um, but I think it's a great heads up. Um, it's hard to sort of think about these things sometimes when you're in the thick of residency and working so hard and to have some kind of plan. I'm a planner, so I feel like many of you are too in, in looking at this stuff and thinking about it early on. Anyone else? I will just jump in quickly and say, even if you're not, so as someone who just interviewed and is starting residency, even if you're not thinking about it yet, don't get stressed out, not everybody. <laughs> I too am a planner, but I think it's really easy to hear, you know, a lot of these ideas float around. And if you're someone who doesn't really have an idea of what they want to do yet, get really anxious about that. And it's oh, fine. Yeah. It's fine. Oh, um, or change. Like it's totally fine yeah. to change. I, I thought, you know, I loved this field, but I also loved addiction. And I was so torn with like which fellowship to do or what should I do. Um, 
but you can always change your mind. That's what's so wonderful about psychiatry is like, if you decide to do addiction for 10 years and then you're like, oh, maybe I'm a little burned out. Like you can move on to do something else. Um, and that's what I really love. Or if you want to do inpatient and then you decide you don't want to do inpatient after two to five years or something, you can do something else. And I think that's what's really attracted me to psychiatry is like, you can really be in whatever area, right? If you don't, if you're not really interested in getting to know your patients for 10 years, you work in an ER, which can be so exciting um, and really fantastic. So I think it's also just uh, great how many choices we have um, and changes that we can make in the career as it goes on. I, I think a lot of people and a lot of practices don't have that option, right? Like if you're a general surgeon, it's pretty hard to kind of like pivot easily. Um, I think in psychiatry, our jobs can look very different from one another. These have been wonderful questions. If there's any more, I'm happy to answer them or anything else that you think I didn't talk about enough or that you'd like to hear about, but you can also absolutely email me um, or follow me on Instagram. It's a little bit, I didn't mention my the media stuff that I do, but that's also a great interest of mine. And I think um, where that stems out of is really loving education. Like I love teaching medical students and other residents when I was in training. Um, and I felt like I was missing some of that. And, you know, I always think, researching articles and doing um, a lot of academic medicine is wonderful, but sometimes it feels like an echo chamber. It's like, who's reading, you know, um, you know, all the, all the, all the journals, it's just other doctors. And then I think like, there's a lot that the general public and the lay public doesn't know about our field. Uh, our field is incredibly stigmatized. I hope that that's changing, especially with all of you uh, getting into the field. Uh, I think we're definitely moving in the right direction, but why I'm passionate about it is that I feel like it gives people access to basic information that they don't have access to. Um, and I have kind of loved the feedback and being able to give people you know, a little bit of hope and information. Uh, of course, it gets complicated because I think some people want medical advice. Uh, that's why you see on all those Instagram handles, like not medical advice, just education. Uh, but I think it's it's been really exciting to, to be able to, to use that platform to talk to more people and to inform more people about reproductive or perinatal psychiatry. Um, and so I do that both in English and Spanish, which are the two languages that I'm fluent in. Um, and that's been a wonderful, really fulfilling uh, area, even though, you know, it's totally, you don't get paid for it. Uh, similarly, with any appearances on TV, you don't get paid for them. Um, so they're really voluntary. Uh, but I think they're a nice way to reach people that maybe you would never reach that might never see a psychiatrist, but yet have access to more information um, or know that they're not alone in the experience they're having. Um, and there's really exciting platforms. Like I just did a talk on this app called Peanut, which is all over the world and it's connecting people during pregnancy and postpartum. And they go on, I guess, kind of like Clubhouse and just have conversations, but they talk to like random women all over the world or people that are, you know, birthing people that don't identify as women. And it's really phenomenal. And I went on, I was like, what is this? Like I, what's clubhouse? Like, what are these things where you just talk and then people, but, but it's really fantastic. It's almost like the new chat room um, and being able to hear someone's voice and connect and share stories. Like, I think there's some really exciting uh, prospects for how we can get some of this information out. So I would definitely encourage you all to sort of look into that. And if you're interested in disseminating information in that way, I do think informing the lay public about what we do and destigmatizing it as well as like demystifying it. Some people are like, Ooh, what does a psychiatrist do? Um, I'm like, it's not, it's not that scary. Uh, and so I do think, uh, that it has been really fulfilling and wonderful. Um, so if you're interested in that, definitely, I would encourage you to, to do it responsibly, of course, and we're, we're learning as we go, uh, including about self-disclosure. It's so complicated, but 
in my residency programs, like people shouldn't know anything about you. Um, they shouldn't know, like if you have children, don't put pictures of your family. Um, you know, you're really like this blank slate for them. And that's very, a very analytical uh, sort of old school perspective. But I think we've changed in that way. And, and it, there's some great examples of people that can do self-disclosure, uh, but it's still appropriate. And it's not sort of getting in the way of therapy, but there's definitely a lot for us to learn and talk about in, in terms of our social media presences and, and how we sort of talk about things or talk about ourselves, uh, which I think is pretty fascinating. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Oreck. Uh, I just want to say you. there is one last question in the chat, um, sure. and it is, how often do you work up hormonal dysregulation as a cause of mental illness? Yeah, so this is a complicated one. Um, and we think hormones are an influence in a, in a lot of these mental health issues. Unfortunately, apart from the time that we're in perimenopause, so in perimenopause, we, we know some of the lab values that we're looking for. That's not the case during premenstrual dysphoric disorder or pregnancy and postpartum. And so we're really basing it on symptoms and going from there. But we have some ideas of what's going on and what's not going on. And there are some hormone mediated treatments for postpartum depression, for example. Um, the braxanolone is the big one. And you might have heard of this is now an IV. Um, and that infusion is given uh, for a couple of days. And it's really based on we think, you know, it's, it's a progesterone uh, breakdown product. And there's where we think like, actually, this is different from other types of depression. It worked like this hormone is improving this depression. And so that's sort of, I think what's going to lead us to maybe understanding more about the hormonal mechanisms, but right now it's sort of a hypothesis, but we don't do that many workups like to see where people's estrogens or progesterones are and to then supplement them. Um, what we do see is like sometimes oral birth control can be helpful in PMDD. So we try it, but it's a little bit of like trial and error versus actually doing those hormone panels, except for perimenopause because we need more research. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been such a pleasure. I wish all of you the best of luck and so excited that we have so many people interested in psychiatry. I think that's always reassuring. Yes, thank you for joining us today. Awesome, thank you. Have a good one.